WSDQ Dunlap, WEPG South Pittsburgh, The Copperhead, WSDT Saudi Daisy, Chattanooga. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. And good afternoon. This is Life of Stuff with the Dr. Mikes. I'm Dr. Michael Crone. And I'm Dr. Mike Hargett. I'm uh, glad to be back uh, person to person with uh, Dr. Crone, who's back from his uh, trip across the country. So I'm sure he's got a little summation of, uh, of all his adventures. So glad, glad to see you back, Mike. Well, it's good to be back. It's good to be back and um, be, you know, nice and comfortable and mostly moved in and expecting to be in one spot for several months, or at least a few, who knows. <laughs> the summary of going across the country is I think on a small scale, I will never be able to see everything that there is in the country. Very good. Well, if you didn't learn anything, you learned that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's and and I like I like just watching what happens when you're outside. You know, like I was out camping in Arizona last week near Flesh Pass, which is just north of Flagstaff, and I was walking past. They actually call it Schultz Tank. I'm not sure why. Maybe just because it's for storing water for the cattle and stuff like that. But it's basically a pond. And you know how it is that when you go walking around a lake or a pond like that, there will be birds there. And when I go walking along, what they do is they go they go flutter like five yards ahead maybe at tops, and then I keep walking along, and then they'll flutter again to be five yards ahead. You know how the birds do that sometimes when you walk? You know how they're doing that? And I'm doing that, and a couple of um, dogs that are off leash just come running in. Mostly they're interested in the water, you know. And, and you know, I was curious when I started seeing them come. I was like, I wonder if the birds are going to play around in the same way with those dogs. And, no, they didn't. They were just gone. <laughs> mm. And, you know, you just watch things like that and think about how things go. And um, I think, you know, one one reason why, why, unlike you, I'll probably never run for office, but I think just personality-wise, in, in that analogy, I'm never going to be the dogs. I'm never going to be the one. That people are like, oh no, that guy is trouble. <laughs> you know, we're not messing with him. <laughs> it doesn't even matter what I'm going to do or what I intend to do. I end up having to do it to prove that I will, because no one ever believed I was gonna until it happened. <laughs> so it's interesting that the birds treated you different than they reacted to the dog, and that's an interesting thing in itself. Is what you're saying? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's just interesting. I was wondering, because, you know, I'm just walking along, not really paying attention. Those dogs are kind of running and excited, you know. And, and that may be part of why the, why they were like that. But I think they're also, you know, the birds are probably used to the people they see being a little better behaved than the dogs they see. And I wouldn't be surprised if some dogs had just, you know, gotten birds more so than, say, some person that was just running around, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of like St. Augustine. Uh, we've been taking this course about St. Augustine, and he believes that that if you just uh, just experience life, if you just kind of like sit back and watch it, he said there's so much to, to experience, then, and you can extrapolate, in his case, talking about God and talking about creation, but just we're so often in a hurry, we're so often we want to do this and that, and we have an agenda, and we have a time strain. But sometimes if you just relax and watch and observe things like you observe the birds, that there's so much there that that will help you grow and, and enrich you. So that's, that's neat. Yeah. And and the other exciting thing that happened at the the, the same campsite a couple of days later, actually that was – the campsite was maybe half a mile from, from the pond I'm talking about. But the same place I was camping, you know, that I'd, I'd hiked to the pond from, is that some, some animal – destroyed, you know, you know those canvas chairs where well, you've seen it. I know Dr. Argonaut has actually seen the chair. I showed it to him. <laughs> Some animal destroyed my chair. And in, in um, at least a dozen years of going around camping like that, I've never had that happen before. <laughs> yep, they, they, whatever it was, chewed that chair up. It was uh, chewed it right off of the metal frame, 
and uh, and and shoot some extra uh, in a couple spots. So, uh, uh, you know, it'd been interesting to find out what what kind of critter that was. Yeah, I'd be curious. I don't know if I'll I'll ever know or anything like that. And hopefully, it's not. You know, it was done um, maybe for nesting material. It left. I picked up some of the pieces, but it also left some other pieces around on the ground that were too small for me to pick up. But maybe it got some even smaller ones. Because the other thing that would get me is that it was trying to be aggressive about it, you know, like it didn't like to share in some way. That's that's kind of worrisome, you know. <laughs> if animals are getting like that, and that's that's when you've got to start worrying, you know, if they're starting getting aggressive against things. And and I should say that the the it's the sort of area that gets a lot of visitors. There's a whole lot of people that come hiking and bicycling and you know moto bike riding and stuff like that around there and that is the sort of place where the animals start to get tame in my experience and you start to see more of them because it's out you know when you're when you're out in the hinterlands they're they're afraid of what a person's going to do whereas when they're near and that that really from probably the closest house um that that's in sort of the Flagstaff, whether it's in the city limits or not, I don't know, but, you know, in the area of Flagstaff extended, probably only a few miles where the houses start and stuff like that. Um, so they start to get used to trash. They start to think they can get good things from people. They start to uh, realize that most of the time that they run into a person, they don't get killed, you know, and so they're like, oh, this is okay, you know. And, and that's when, when you start to have some kind of issue with them. We've actually been in Flagstaff one time. It was they had the uh, along Route 66, I believe, was the route. And uh, and in the same trip, we went to uh, went to that place. What's the name of that town? Uh, Winslow, Arizona. Yeah, from the from the uh, the, the Eagle song. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You're getting one Eagle song, and you're famous now. <laughs> well, that was fun. That was a different kind of a trip. But yeah, that that is very. Uh, Almost a hinterland, but yeah, there's starting to be some civilization. And there's a mountain out there. I think it has kind of like a, a white peak that's used in Paramount Pictures, if I recall. Hmm. Well, the near there, there's a couple of peaks: Humphreys Peak and San Francisco Peak. Humphreys Peak is hiked a lot. Um, San Francisco Peak might be hiked a lot too. I don't know. In that area, I mean, I talked to somebody camping there that hiked at least. I don't know if he went all the way up, but you know, up on the Humphreys Peak. And San Francisco Peak, I believe, is the tallest mountain in Arizona. So, hmm. Very good. I, either one of them could be Paramount Pictures yeah, logo. Yeah, I mean, we, we we can get it. We another thing that's notable at the Arizona Utah border is uh, Monument Valley, which is a, a recognizable um, area. It's, it's a completely different thing. It's not a mountain peak. It's those funny kind of like. Uh, you know, brown spires that you sometimes see out in the desert. So it's kind of a collection of those on the Navajo Nation uh, near the Arizona-Utah um, border. And they've also filmed a number of movies in that area, so they have just shown up. And they look kind of classic, you know, look like classic West, so people people will uh, see those. I didn't see it, but apparently... Um, Back to the Future 3 is actually kind of a Western in that they go back in the past, you know, and do things. And um, when I was watching that recently, um, one of the people I was watching it with said, hey, is there a Monument Valley? Just seeing it on TV. I was like, wow, I didn't have that kind of... (laughs) Pretty good. Yeah, it's like a set, like a naturally occurring set. And there's a couple scenes like it. In fact, there's, there's a road in California that comes down off the mountains that they use a lot in these windy roads chase scenes. And if you've ever driven it, as soon as you get on it, you start to get this feeling like you've been there before. Deja vu. (laughs) Never thought of movies as the reason for deja vu. (laughs) But anyway, this is uh, life and stuff. We've talked about stuff for a little bit here. And um, i got to start with some good news. Um, New Hampshire has defunded Planned Parenthood. Yeah. So I really don't have much more to say on that. I just wanted to bring that up. And, and I think this has been done, you know, based on the whole undercover videos that uh, we were talking about last week. I still find 
I don't know if I will ever get what makes something catch on. Meaning? What I mean is, this is old news. You know, I mean, as as we were talking about last week, you know, Defend Life, and they may not have been the first to talk about it, talked about a, a Maryland company, Defend Life, is basically deals with the Maryland and some surrounding areas, with a Maryland company that, that was selling uh, fetal body parts that somebody had happened across, you know, trying to sell them online. Um, I don't say trying to sell them. They probably were making sales, you know. They just had a website, sales website put up, you know, for – and um, that was in 2011 that that was published in Defend Life. But it didn't seem to have legs at that point, you know. That came out, and everyone's like, well, yeah, that's what happens when you start killing babies, you know, and just <laughs> not even treating them as humans that you bury afterwards, you know. Then you start selling the body parts because, you know, that's that's what happens didn't have legs then, what's the difference between then and now? Well, for me, I think the mushy middle that you're always talking about doesn't necessarily want to deal with the reality of abortion, kind of like the face the truth towards. So until you get an undercover video crew go in like they did, which they must have did a great job, and the ones that, films I saw were, it's hard to watch them. But they've made the point that Planned Parenthood is openly selling up with the baby's body parts. And they did a good job. It was concise. It was You couldn't really argue with it other than the fact that terminology, whether you call it selling or, or, or getting their expenses. But nonetheless, they did it, and they did it in such a way that even some major media types picked it up and ran with it. And that one guy, did uh, one announcer, did a commentary. It did, it did gather legs or, 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 you know, grew legs. And I think it's I think it's great that that they finally got a little bit of play. These poor babies. I mean, if you watch that fifth that fifth video, it, your stomach just goes into a knot. Such a barbaric act. But then they sit around and talk about it, and this is cold, selling body part kind of. It's it, it's just disgusting. And for our Congress, or who was the Congress or the, the Senate of the House that voted uh, not to defund them. Uh, Terrible. Yeah, but, you know, one good thing, Ruth, and I'll give you back to the, the floor, is that I saw an email today from a friend of mine, and a lot of these companies that have that have uh, supported Planned Parenthood, a lot of them are now are, are backing off a little bit. You know, they're, they're, they're having all these disclaimers about any past support and how they feel about it. So so even though even though the Congress did not defund them, the, the, uh, the bad will that these videos uh, – generated for Planned Parenthood is is tremendous. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree that the, this is this has made it this has made it worse. I mean, we got the New Hampshire thing. Um, uh, it'll be interesting to see. I know um, you you and Jane, your wife, get the the boycott list from. Uh, is it Life Decisions International that puts that out? Yeah, Life Deci- Decisions International puts out the boycott list, and you guys are. Uh, get that boycott list, it'll be interesting to see if it has an effect, like if it gets noticeably smaller as a result of this. I hope it does. And and just to be clear, when I say I don't understand why, I'm not complaining that it did catch legs this time. <laughs> I think everyone should understand that just in case there's any question. And, hey, it's great that it caught legs. I just say, I mean, I, and, and maybe it is just it's the existence of the video. Maybe it's just, you know, um, Defend Life, they didn't have a video. They had, you know, they even had someone, you know, going on kind of posing and and asking questions about, you know, what they could get and what they could get for them. But they didn't have, you know, sort of the video. They they certainly didn't have I, – I think um, live action has hours and hours and hours of footage on this. So we, we may even see more on that. So part of legs may just be what can someone do to keep this story going. Maybe I will eventually understand that. I don't know. Right now it still just seems random to me. You know, like one time it got legs, one time it didn't. Well, good for it getting legs this time. I hope it keeps its legs. But the weird thing is, it seems to me like well, we're going to have to go to break. We'll, we'll come uh, back after. Uh, we'll get back. This is uh, Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mikes. We'll be back in five minutes.
Setting. Is Liberty Works Radio Network enlightening you to the real problems we face in our constitutional republic? Has it helped you to better understand what has to be done to save America from becoming a third world nation? If so, do your part in spreading this voice of truth and enlightenment to your fellow Americans. Join the Liberty Works Radio Network Fellowship. Go to www.LibertyWorksRadioNetwork.com for details. Born to freedom. The Liberty Revolution is on. Liberty Works Radio Network. Truth in broadcasting. Liberty Works Radio Network. The American dream was given birth by Samuel Adams, the father of the American Revolution. For 40 years, Sam agitated the American colonists to rebel against the British monarchy. His sacrificial effort cost him the entire fortune he inherited from his father. He was captivated by John Locke's theory that the average man was capable of governing himself, that an aristocracy was counterproductive and oppressive, and that the only lawful function of government was the protection of life and property. All else was an obnoxious intrusion into the affairs of the individual. Those who knew Sam and worked closely with him called him the last of the Puritans. He understood that rights come from God. He declared, The right to freedom, being the gift of God, it is not in the power of man to alienate this gift and voluntarily become a slave. America, born to freedom. The Liberty Revolution is on. Liberty Works Radio Network. Truth in Broadcasting. America born to freedom. The Liberty Revolution is on. Liberty Works Radio Network. Truth in Broadcasting. Mother Teresa couldn't do it all, but she gave it all. Compassion. She didn't just visit the sick and poor. She moved in with them because they needed help. Mother Teresa couldn't do it all, but she gave it all. Compassion. Pass it on. America, born to freedom. The Liberty Revolution is on. Liberty Works Radio Network. Truth in broadcasting. From coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. And we're back with Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mike. I'm Dr. Michael Prone talking to Dr. Michael Hargadon. And we are together, the Dr. Mike's. And I cut you off before we went to break. Come back. Yeah, if I recall, about 25 years ago, the government had gotten out of at least formally supporting Planned Parenthood, and a lot of these corporations and businesses were actually giving the bulk of their funds to, you know, you know that was the main source of contributions other than what they were making on abortion. But then the, then the tables had turned so that the government is openly, openly funding Planned Parenthood, Corporations and businesses are still there, but they didn't seem to be as big of an issue since the government had jumped in and started throwing money around. So uh, that's that's kind of an interesting twist. You recall that, Mike? I didn't recall that that Planned Parenthood was ever defunded by the government or not funded at all. I think that's a. I'm pretty sure they were, especially during uh, some of the earlier Republican administrations, like back when uh, Reagan was around and all. It was. If they were funded, it wasn't openly funded. It was one of these things where they, they slid the money to another program. But they ran, from what I recall, as the government was not directly funding Planned Parenthood. So we can check into that. Maybe it's next Yeah, we can check into that. It, it does sound like the sort of thing that could have changed under the Clinton administration. Now, Clinton, my politics in general were different 
under Clinton, I hadn't talked to as many. Um, I really hadn't come across to being a libertarian. I used the small L word for myself a lot, but mostly that meant not wanting victimless crimes to be in existence. But in terms of economic issues, I was not yet who I am today when Clinton was first elected. And one of the reasons I bring that up is not just to sort of tell my story, it's to tell I regret now that I voted for Clinton in 92 as wow. someone who was, um, and this was someone doing what a lot of people do today. And I don't know if people in, you know, Liberty people will find this, but you never know what's going to prevent yourself. So they may find themselves in this situation too, is I was like, well, here's a guy whose policies I like, except for abortion. Right. And here's what he did on the things that I thought I liked at the time, like having a safety net for the poor. He actually did what I now view as one of the better reforms that we've had, which is he actually, you could describe it as ended the federal entitlement when he signed the welfare reform in 96. So he didn't do the things that, you know, I'd been like, you know, you got to have the Democrats take care of the poor. Yeah, they kind of take care of them like the mob does. But, you know, that's what I was thinking at the time. But I was there like, yeah, he favors abortion rights, but what are you going to do? And here's what he did on that. Even though, you know, I mean, no one was talking about just as honestly the politicians running for the Republican nomination now are not talking about, you know, ending the right to abortion under their administration. No one was talking about it then. There weren't even pundits like me that I heard talking about it, even though I was pro-life, you know, and, and was for it. Well, what do you get by electing President Clinton? Well, you get the FACE Act, which was used to basically bankrupt what has been described, I'd have to look up the reference for it, as the largest nonviolent resistance movement in the history of the country, which was Operation Rescue. So you get that. Oh, it doesn't make any difference. And you also got putting federal funds to Planned Parenthood. Yeah, I'll, I'll buy that, too. I recently saw that 40% of Planned Parenthood's money is now from the federal government. So, And, you know, I mean, there, there are other abortion providers, and I presume that some of them get federal funds. We always talk about if you defund Planned Parenthood, then you – well, no. I mean, there are other abortion providers. I mean, we can talk about – well, that's the thing. is that We all know their names, but we know they exist. They are not the only abortion provider in the U.S. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of private clinics that do abortions, right. I get you. Right. That, that's all I'm saying is there are other abortion providers. And I'd actually be surprised if Planned Parenthood is the only one that gets federal funding. I liked it when they were talking. Sometimes they call it defunding Planned Parenthood, and it's either one of two things. One is they specifically mention Planned Parenthood based on something like this video that came out. The other thing they can do is – they can actually defund abortion providers, you know, put in, put in the bill language that, you know, the, the federal money, the state money can't go to abortion providers. And I just want to point out that I'm uh, much in favor of the latter over the, the first one, although either one, if it happens right now, is a good thing. But I think if you... If you defund abortion providers, you're clear about what your reason is for doing it because, you know, abortion is despicable or whatever. Whereas if you pick and choose, you know, a specific organization, you're just leaving yourself open for someone else to fill that gap, you know, for someone else to be, hey, you know, I, you know, I mean, they'll be the federally operated one and suddenly they'll grow to be, you know, one of the bigger ones in the country. Well, that's going to happen anyway. So, I mean, but if you are going to pick on one, you may as well pick on the largest abortion provider in the in the country, if not the world. I mean, probably I say the country. But Planned Parenthood actually goes international in some respects. So, if if you are going to pick on, yeah, if you are, yeah, if you are going to pick one. Yeah. Now, now there there are things that I like, and obviously what you might call object level or policy level things that I don't like, as well as strategic things that I don't like about Saul Alinsky. But I actually think it's a good, for anyone who wants to bring about social change, I think it's a good exercise to read his books, Rules for Radicals, that he wrote near the end of his life, which was basically about what, what I try and be 
is a realistic radical, to use his phrase, you know, someone who wants to make radical change but actually looks at the situation on the ground rather than just saying, we need this change, you know, actually looks at the situation on the ground. This is something that, that I like about what he did. And you remind me, in, in contradicting me about one of the things that he said, is that, you know, when, when he was organizing against um, companies, you know, when he was trying to get, get unions going in these places, he said... Where did he organize Yeah. What he would do is he would pick one company. doesn't matter that the other companies, you know, were any better or worse. It might be best to get the worst company, but just it's important to pick one. You know, he uses the example of, of the auto companies. He unionized the auto companies by doing it one at a time. If he tried to unionize them all at the same time, they'd band together and be, you know, a, uh, a, a coalition, you know, and help each other out. Whereas he, if he's given union trouble to Ford, Chrysler is happy. Oh, Lewinsky unionized auto companies? Well, he talks about helping to do that. I don't think he did that, you know, specifically on his own, but he talks about some of the strategy of it um, and and some things that that um, so. And he, his early his early beginnings were in the 30s when when a lot of this stuff was happening. Um, so I I don't know if he's specifically in the book talking about you doing it himself or just using it as an example. And he would do the same thing with um, uh, department stores that I, I'm not actually sure if some of these were actually doing discrimination, but in the late 60s were um, people felt were being unfair in some way to the African-American customers. Um, and he would pick one of them, even though, you know, the feeling was that they were just all doing it, and go after them so that, you know, rather than the th- something that will make them form a coalition, will make them, um, uh, I, I, I'm trying to be a talker here, I'm on the radio, but you know, what's the opposite of forming, will we'll make them say, oh, well, you know, you're going after company A, company B is their competition, it's like, hey, that's good for us. I'm not sure we're going to see that. I just tell that story because I want to say, that, you know, I've sort of, under certain circumstances, I think it is worth doing, um, and I think sometimes, you know, in terms of like things like the boycott list, um, it's worth doing. But I'm not sure in terms of abortion providers that they view each other as competition in that way. So I'm not sure in that specific case it'll work. Um, but but one place where I think it might work is in the companies that support and donate to abortion providers. Well, you know, I actually think it would be good if the emotional mill would just take notice and start shopping, start spending their money in places that support their values, no matter what they are. So say like uh, uh, Starbucks. I mean, Starbucks has been supporting Planned Parenthood. Starbucks, for those who, who, who value traditional marriage, the CEO told people that if you value traditional marriage, you can just sell your shares of stock. Well, you'll still see people who who have these values go in there and dump the money for this for this worthless, expensive coffee, and then they sit back and complain about about uh, well, they they support this and they support that. Well, uh, you know, at some point, people have to get serious about the principles, no matter what they are, and then translate that into economic support or economic non-support. That's not too big. Well, I mean. Let me let me try and the, the counter example that comes to mind whenever people talk about this is Cuba, because if you have some sort of relation with your opponents, you have the opportunity, as was happened to most of the Eastern Bloc, you know, most of the socialist leaning countries of the 80s in that Latin America. They, they basically said, you know, they, they get this propaganda. They, they think they don't like you, but then they actually get to meet you. <laughs> and first off, you're not liked it as soon as you, as soon as you show up. And second off, in, in the case of, of uh, you know, Western versus communist society, they'll see it's actually more comfortable to live that way, you know. 
And when when we isolated Cuba, which for, you know, historical reasons in the 60s it was determined that we should do that, we basically put them in a position where they they didn't even really hear our point of view. And I think the same might happen. If you're a customer of Starbucks and you say, hey, I, I, I don't like that you're doing this. Yeah, at first, then, you know, I mean, it's one customer saying whatever. But it's more than someone who doesn't even go there in the first place. If they can make a profit without you, and they've already figured out they can make a profit without you, why would they listen to you in the first place? They don't. So I don't understand what your point is other than the fact that the boycott list, which uh, which like to see international put there, basically gives people who do have uh, principles and morals that, that maybe aren't exactly, you know, just anything goes, uh, a means to spend their money to support other businesses that do have those values. You know, I, I don't see how it compares to Cuba. Well, my point is that if if Starbucks has no relation with you, they're going to care even less what you think. So if, exactly. Right. So if you're not shopping at Starbucks, they're going to care even less what you think. Uh, I agree, but like we did used to shop at Weiss. Weiss insisted on giving money to Susan G. Komen, who insisted on giving over $750,000 at least to a Planned Parenthood. So we in turn complained to the to the management and complained again to the management and finally we said we're not shopping here anymore and we haven't. So so in my case with Starbucks, yeah, I don't I don't like the property Starbucks. But if somebody wanted to give me a couple of Starbucks, I would refuse it. So so uh, but at the same time, my point is, is that there's a lot of people who, who may uh who may agree on values but they don't care where they spend their, their $5 for this and $5 for that, but they don't realize that that money translates into profit, translates into money being spent on causes that they disagree with. That's my point. And there's always, and there's always some of that. I think there's, there's the pro and the con to a boycott. And I will give you this. I mean, it's an extreme case, but if someone comes to me and they're like, I, w- I want to buy, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I want to sell my car so that I can buy a gun to go kill somebody. I'm like, no. <laughs> I mean, if it's at some level, it becomes immediate. I will be like, no, I have no relation with you. <laughs> this is Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mike. <laughs> we'll be back in five minutes. America, born to freedom. The Liberty Revolution is on. Liberty Works Radio Network. Truth in broadcasting. It's not easy being a veteran. Coming back from Iraq or Afghanistan. Not everyone understands that. You don't feel the same. Join us at communityofveterans.org. And connect to others who are going through the same thing. Because no one knows what it's like to come back unless they were there. Brought to you by Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. I know what you're going through. I've been there. And now, for the Institute on the Constitution, here's Michael Anthony Perutka with The American View. All law and all lawmaking is religious in the sense that it derives its authority to act from something outside of or above itself. In this country, that something that our law is based on is the Bible. This is clearly apparent not only in the text of the Declaration of Independence, but it's also demonstrated in the texts of our earliest covenants, constitutions, and charters. And this fact is known and recognized by Christians and non-Christians alike. For example, a 1982 Newsweek magazine cover story headlined, How the Bible Made America, said that historians were discovering that the Bible is our founding document. In our country, until relatively recently, God's word, his law, was the standard used to judge whether man-made statutes were just or unjust. Now, this view is taught in scripture itself. It is also taught in the writings of St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, and the great British jurist Sir William Blackstone and by the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. In his famous letter from a Birmingham jail, Dr. King said this, A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. Dr. King went on to remind us that we should never forget that everything that Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal. The word legal he placed in quote marks because, of course, what Hitler did was not legal since it violated God's law. Any act of a lawmaking body isn't law if it isn't moral, and it isn't moral if it isn't biblical. 
This is Michael Anthony Peruca for Institute on the Constitution, bringing you The American View. This is Rob McQuay for the Institute on the Constitution, and you've just finished hearing Michael Anthony Peruca's commentary on The American View. The views and opinions expressed are not necessarily those of this radio station, and we welcome any comments and suggestions you may care to offer by emailing us at michael at theamericanview.com. If you'd like to learn more about the Institute on the Constitution's work, you can find out more about who we are and what we do at theamericanview.com. With the national debt climbing to an estimated $11 trillion, the White House announced an emergency economic plan today, trading the national gold reserves for cash through precious metal buyers, cashforgold.com. I got $583 from cashforgold.com. As you know, we have these very large debts, and the fact is the gold reserves are just sitting there. This woman turned in her wedding ring from her first marriage and got money the next day. If it worked for her, it can work for the United States. How much does the federal government expect to receive in exchange for all the gold? But that the Treasury Department should have looked into competing cash companies like dollarsforgold.com. The reality is we have over a trillion dollars in economic stimulus packages well, to we pay do. for it. We just need that cash now. The president agrees that this seems like a pretty good deal. But is there a contingency plan if that proves not to be the case? Well, yes, of course. The cash be. received from the cashforgold.com plan is going to be supplemented by funding from the selling of White House furniture on Craigslist.org. Well, that is correct. We've already sold a giant military map that we don't use very often. Peeling back the layers every day with Copperhead 1240, 1190, and 910 AM. Southern Rock, Kickin' Country, and Tennessee Talk. I pledge allegiance to the Constitution of the American States United and to the Republic, which it created, implementing God's governmental plan for man and asking his blessing for its observance, which will provide liberty and justice for all, for all, for all, for all. For all. America, born to freedom. The Liberty Revolution is on. Liberty Works Radio Network. Truth in broadcasting. Dad, where did the clouds come from? Well, buddy, that's a good question. Is this worm a boy or a girl? Um, why are turns orange? Actually, Dad, why don't you have any hair on your head? How do birds fly? Why is dirt brown? Why can't I fly? Are we there yet? may not have all the answers, but if they're comfortable coming to you now when the questions are small, they'll come to you with the bigger questions later. Dad, can I ask you something? Give your family everything. Give them your time. America, born to freedom. The Liberty Revolution is on. Liberty Works Radio Network. Truth in Broadcasting. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. And we're back with Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mike. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Michael Crone talking to Dr. Michael Carganon. And I'm glad that you're not going to sell your car so somebody can buy and go on and kill somebody. That's, that can be a story, Dr. Crow. But to be honest, on some level, how many things are there that I can buy where I could completely isolate myself from someone that's going to do something bad with some of the profits that they get from the money? Well, granted, there's a degree to which you can function like this, but just attempting to do it, it makes you live your morals or, or, or your, your principles. Because to just to have these principles and then to spend your money with a company that you know is in, is in direct violation and supports the opposite side of your principle, and then that's like insanity. It's like it makes no sense to me. So, an example, I was just talking about uh, Susan B. Komen. Well, earlier when, when Planned Parenthood took some heat, they had been claiming that they were doing uh, that they were saving women from breast cancer. Well, it came out that, that Planned Parenthood does not do mammograms. So what happens now that Planned Parenthood comes under the heat, they have commercials on television with a woman crediting Planned Parenthood was, was saving her because they found her breast cancer. I mean, this this is the kind of, like, big media 
deception that 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 comes across. And and for the average Joe who doesn't who thinks he cares but doesn't care enough to to, to put two and two together, they just watch this stuff and say, oh yeah, that's what happened. So people have to wake up. Is my point. People have to start putting their money where their values are. Here's an example I, I remember from you, just to, again, do, do the opposite side of this. And I'll tell you from the beginning, the point is that almost everyone in the elite, well, not almost everyone, but a significant majority in the elite running the economy in the United States and probably in the Western world are in a subculture that is way, way disproportionately supportive of abortion, abortion rights, and these things. And, and the example that comes to mind is Microsoft was something I remember you being all happy to be free of. Is that correct? I mean, you were free of Microsoft by going to Macintosh at one point in your life, or maybe now. Uh, a little bit of a relief just to know that I had an alternative, what do they call it, a server or a system, you know, computer system. Yeah, it was it was nice. And I would actually, if I had a, if I had my brothers, I would get one of these uh, systems called Linux or something. There's a system that you can it has its own working system that you can kind of like build. I'm not I'm not that familiar with it, but I've been told about it. So. Right. So what's your point? Well, my point is that that Apple, you know, Steve Jobs, the founder and and longtime CEO of Apple, well, his statements are mixed. Is no like. No, to, to use your phrase, what was it, person who shares your values? <laughs> Agreed. I said there's a, there's a degree it's at some point where you, you just have to either totally give it up or, or make, make a decision A or B. I mean, just take, take the presidential candidate in this GOP race. I don't support Israel outright. I think Israel is their own sovereign nation. They should get out of our Congress, our Senate. They should get out of our pocketbook. But they're going to be up there at this debate trying to outdo the next person on how much money they're going to give our tax dollars to this foreign country or, or how many more military, uh, you know, assistances we're going, to, we're going to get involved in for this country. And the one's going to try to outdo the other. But there's none of them that are going to go on there and say, well, Israel's a foreign country. They've got to take care of their own, and uh, we should stay out of their business. That's the same kind of idea, uh, the way I see it. It's like, it's like there, you get to a point where when the entire field is slanted, then you really don't have a choice. Is that what you're saying? Like, I don't think I was saying that. I'm not sure what actually got you on that. <laughs> oh, I get the analogy now. The analogy between the candidates, and none of them are, are doing what you want, but you still got to pick one, yes. and the computers, yes. and none of them share your values. Okay. I, I, for some reason, I'm a little bit slow on that. But I, I get where you're going with that. Okay. Because I was like, why did you go into that? We're leveling but, but, out. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's kind of true. And, and, you know, I mean, there, there are things that can be done, and part of why I think it fits to go back there is because just earlier in this show when I was telling the story of Saul Alinsky, I think he had in that case, and he has, among the things he, he has, he has some good ideas and some things that I think worked, and I need to put them in like square quotes worked, but were actually bad ideas and that they turned off, even though they scared people into capitulating, they turned off more people than they helped. And those, to me, are bad ideas, even from a practical, you know, realistic, radical sort of view. But one of his good ideas when dealing with something that I think we are as the pro-life movement, which is populist, but supported perhaps even in a small minority of the elite, is to pick one at a time who you attack. And in terms of the computer providers, if somehow there's somebody in charge that could coordinate it so that everyone's boycotting Microsoft because of their support for abortion providers, and even if, you know, the benefits of any competition are murky, you know, they're just like, oh, we're all going after that one. I think that is actually a good strategy in that sense. Unfortunately, it never really got legs enough to work in that way, to work enough to actually sort of force Microsoft to stop doing that. Maybe in that case, but Life Decisions International does, at least they did, issue a company of the month, so to speak, 
and they would pick out one of these major corporations and they would target them and they would encourage everybody who gets this boycott list to send emails, to make phone calls, to actually put pressure on this one company. And often that same company within a month or two would recapitulate and change its support. So that idea does work. Right. Yeah, that, I mean, that sounds like a good use. I mean, like they either read the same book or, you know, great minds think alike. <laughs> and that sounds like a good use of that. I think on some level, and it will probably happen after they lose to the democratic process, and that I would call it, you know, the minority culture, meaning not minority as in ethnic minorities, by minority as in like a minority of, you know, the American culture, the minority culture that serves to be in the elite, in the corporations, and in the universities, and that sort of thing, that culture will probably come around after they lose through the electoral process. But at some point, they will have to be made to come around. And it might be after they lose. I mean, you know, what, what happened with the Civil War is there were some people who – you know, it took the Civil War for them to be like, you know, that slavery was a really big mistake. And most of those people were in the North. No, no, actually, I mean, there's a specific example, um, and I can't remember his name, but he was the governor of Virginia. Uh, I don't know the term for this, but the guy who was most recently governor, but not currently governor, at the time that Virginia seceded. And he was such a strong... Um, pro-slavery advocate, I can't think of another word, and part of the reason why I've heard of him is he was the guy who was, you know, governor of Virginia during the raid on Harper's Ferry and other things where he had even more opportunity to sort of make his his thing known. He was such a pro-slavery um, that he actually took on actions against the federal government before Virginia, which was slower than some of the other southern states to secede, seceded from the Union. Um, and he took on actions in Virginia against federal installations. He actually went, um, did a raid on his own. The second raid, much less famous, on Harper's Ferry was the ex-governor of Virginia saying, they're fortifying this while we dilly-dally. I'm going to go get people together and take it. And this was the guy with this attitude. And he said after the Civil War, you know what? Slavery was such a mistake. Because everything else that, that he held dear, and that we, we as a country are weaker for not having now, like states' rights <laughs> and well, independence and adherence to a written constitution. Those lost because they became associated with slavery. Well, it sounds like he had more sense than Lincoln, because Lincoln had no problem with slavery. He said he'd take a union that was united with slaves, but without slaves. He, he, the, whole, the whole Civil War and slavery issue is somewhat, uh, you know, like mixed and, and, and like almost like rewritten. Because if Lincoln's going to take slavery with the United Union, was the war really about slavery or was it about the Union? It was in terms of the words that um, Abraham Lincoln said about the Union. Yeah. There's, there's no question. I mean, he said, he said that. Um, now, this is even more surprising to me, and probably took more desperation. But Jefferson Davis offered to phase out slavery to try and get France in, on their side in the Civil War. Didn't work, but he'd offered that. I mean, I think on both sides, you know. Although I think it, in that case, there was probably a little bit more um, desperation on the part of of Jefferson Davis, you know, he was just like, somebody's got to help, because this, I believe, was late in the war when it kind of seemed that unless something turned things around, you know, the whole cause was going to be lost. But, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, in, in fact, in, in talking to the Liberty Works people, there probably aren't a huge number of people we have to convince that the Civil War <laughs> was, war was not Northern, over slavery. The war, the war of Northern Aggression. Let's get that yeah. right. Yeah. The War of Northern Aggression. But, but to be, to be um, honest, I think there's also something we can learn from how that went, 
because I am also of the opinion that the situation of the African American in the 19th century would have been much better had it not seemed so corrupt the way that slavery was was um, eliminated. I mean, from the get-go, Lincoln was saying, this is only about the Union, it's not about slavery. And the South was saying, we don't believe you. <laughs> and then, you know, whether rightly or not, he um, emancipated some of the slaves, and in areas in the South, he emancipated only those slaves in the part of the South that the Union had not taken over yet at the time that he did the Emancipation Proclamation. Wow, that is but terrible. it did have the effect of doing exactly what the South accused him of doing that he said he wasn't going to do. <laughs> you know, but he said, this is not about ending slavery in the South. This is about, I mean, I don't believe in expanding any slavery into the territories. And then he did, in those areas that it applied to, exactly what he said he wasn't going to do. And when it goes that way, it it had a certain what, what's the, I, lack of legitimacy, I guess, is the best phrase. And this is one reason why... I support some of the actions that restrict abortion, especially because for legal reasons they need to do it this way by other means. You know, they restrict abortion by putting some sort of restriction on it that for anything else, as a libertarian, I'd be like, there's no way I'm going to do that. You know, that, that would be government control on any actual legitimate activity. But the only way that these states can try to stand up to what's become an imperial judiciary is to pretend like they're not actually doing this for abortion, you know, and to say, well, really it's about the, you know, it's a safety regulation or whatever, so that they can get it through the courts. And I support that. It's, it's similar, to go back to the slavery analogy, and we're going to have to cut this off for the end of the show soon. It's similar to the, the Underground Railroad more so than the Emancipation Proclamation. You're saying, we're, we're, we're not, none of these states are outlawing slavery. We're just trying to save as many people as we can in the meantime. But I think in the end, and I think we are closer to ready, we'll have to talk about this sometime later than, than most people give us credit for someone that's willing to be the upfront emancipator. This is Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mike. Talk to you next week. Adios. Join the Calvocate to Freedom, the Calvocate backed to constitutional government. Climb on board and do your part to proclaiming liberty throughout the land. Join and support Liberty Works Radio Network Fellowship. To view the strategic plan, to spread the word, and to get information on joining, go to www.LibertyWorksRadioNetwork.com or call the fellowship office at 410-857-5444. That's 410-857-5444. To join the Calvocate to Freedom. America born to freedom. The Liberty Revolution is on. Liberty Works Radio Network. Truth in Broadcasting. This is Randall Year out on Jurisdiction. When the U.S. territories applied for admission into the Union as states, the overarching principle that drove this decision was the desire to determine their own destinies and to be removed from what the U.S. Constitution calls the exclusive legislative jurisdiction of the Congress over the properties owned by the U.S. government. When what is now the state of Washington removed itself from this exclusive jurisdiction, it was required to write its own constitution, which would provide for a representative Republican form of government for its citizens, such as the case for every state which joined our union. Today, our U.S. government officials and bureaucrats have lost sight of this fact 
and now want to reassert exclusive legislative jurisdiction over the states and turn them into administrative subdivisions as though we were territories again. Sorry, U.S. government, but the Constitution says you don't have that authority. And Americans are beginning to realize that our founders intended for the individual states to either succeed or fail based on their own laws and policies. If the people don't like the way a particular state operates, they can move to another one where they do. The way our federal government operates today, the entire nation either succeeds or fails based on the policies of 535 legislators in Washington, D.C., and from what we can see from its history of failed social policies, I don't think these guys could pour sand out of a boot if the directions were written on the heel. We need to replace the socialist mindset in Washington, D.C. and our state governments with a restored American view of law and government. This constitutional message has been brought to you by the members of the Constitution Party. Visit us at www.constitutionparty.com. Along with Samuel Adams, Patrick Henry was most instrumental in establishing the American dream. Henry made the following plea. The battle, sir, is not for the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. There is no retreat, but in submission and slavery, our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard upon the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable, and let it come. I repeat, sir, let it come. Oh, gentlemen may cry, peace, peace. But there is none. The war has already begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north shall bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Is life so dear and peace so sweet to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry, one of the foremost framers of individual and religious freedom, a son of liberty and the American dream. The Liberty Revolution is on Liberty Works Radio Network. America born to freedom. The Liberty Revolution is on Liberty Works Radio Network. Truth in broadcasting. In 1987, some inner city first graders were promised a college education. Now, this promise didn't come from a wealthy corporation. It came from Oral Lee Brown, who saved a large portion of her modest income every year for these children. She told Miss Brown, you can't do everything I said, no, but we need to do more. And she did more by sending 19 kids to college, helping others pass it on. America born to freedom. The Liberty Revolution is on Liberty Works Radio Network. Truth in broadcast. 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 Truth.